almost there. I think it's much more fun just talking about because these are this is for pre meds, right? Yeah. It's more probably also Mostly. like when talking about like what dermatology, like the life of a dermatologist is like, like what do you expect and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. So I'll probably spend yes, yeah, absolutely. The amount of that. This is more like, you know, for fun, uh, learning some of uh, some of the cases that we see on a regular basis. But, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Okay, so we are live. Hello, web shadowers. Thank you all for joining this session. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Tia Paul, who will be teaching us about dermatology. As always, please remember the Google form will be posted in the chat box and in the description of this video at the end of the session. With that being said, Dr. Paul, you can get started whenever you're ready. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Thank you for um, having me on board. So I wanted to talk about dermatology and uh, what a typical life looks like as a dermatologist, and then also discuss a few cases that we see on a regular basis. So before I move on, I just wanted to very quickly give you a brief intro about me. So I moved to the US when I was 18 from India. And then I went to Cornell University for my undergrad. I studied uh, molecular biology and did a minor in biomedical engineering. I always knew I wanted to go to medical school and uh, also knew it was gonna be competitive because I was an international student. So then I worked for two years after undergrad at a lab at Mass General Hospital in Boston and uh, you know worked really hard and published um, in a bunch of journals. And then for medical school, I went to the Harvard MIT joint uh, medical program, which is still a four year program. So I did an MD, not an MD PhD. And then during that time, you know, I was one of those people when I rotated through every rotation during medical school, I loved, you know, I wanted to become a surgeon one day, the next day I wanted to become an internal medicine doc. And then it was not until the very end of my third year when I had spent time rotating in every specialty then I rotated in dermatology. And for me, one of the criteria was to be able to enjoy what I do a lot and be happy doing what I do. And I saw that the dermatologists in general were super happy and they were still seeing a lot of medical dermatology. And I'll give you an overview of what are the different kinds of dermatology you can practice. But I just saw in general, dermatologists were very happy. I used to ask this one question, especially to all my female attendings. I would ask them that if you had to do this all over again, would you do it? And of course, almost everyone will say yes, but a lot of time I sense some hesitation in some other fields and dermatologists, they were always like, yeah, 100%. So that and the fact that, you know, in derm, it's a very dynamic field. We do a lot of procedures. We also do see like 30 patients or so in a day. So it's very like every day is different and every day is fun. Like I genuinely look forward to coming to work because it's, it's not like the same thing, you know, that you do every single day. And you can do outpatient, you can do inpatient stuff. So it kind of depends on to- exactly whatever you want to do. So hence, I decided to do dermatology. I um, uh, did not take any time to do any extra research here, but I did publish a lot when I, when I was in medical school, and uh, especially during my fourth year of medical school. And then I decided to go to University of Miami for my dermatology residency. So for Term, the way it works is you have to do one year of prelim. So you can do in, in internal medicine, in surgery, in transitional medicine, whichever you want. So it's one year first, and then it's three years of dermatology residency. And then after that, some people might choose to do a one-year fellowship. If you're planning to do a lot of surgeries, there is Mohs Fellowship. There is also Cosmetic Dermatology Fellowship. And there's also some Medical Dermatology Fellowship in some of the uh, academic institutions, but a lot of dermatologists don't end up doing a fellowship. So then I finished my residency in 2019. So it's been just over a little over one year that I have been practicing on my own. Right now I'm located in Orange County, California. And uh, I'll also briefly tell you what my day looks like. So on average, dermatologists probably work work uh, works four days a week. I choose to work five days a week, but two of my days, I don't start till noon, which is really good because, you know, I have a little toddler at home and, you know, I get to spend the morning with her and then I come to work. Typically on average, uh, we probably see 30 patients in a full day. So it's 15 minutes per patient. So if you're seeing eight hours or so, it's eight times four, which is 32 patients in a full day. Uh, You know, there is 
wide variety of things that you see. So if you're more in a private practice uh, sort of a setting, then you're going to see much more of the bread and butter stuff. Most of it in the United States here, it's, you know, a lot of skin checks for skin cancer. Uh, but then there's also like a lot of acne, rosacea, eczema, psoriasis. But then you also, you know, do see some more complicated like autoimmune conditions and stuff like anything can walk into my clinic. And, you know, I need to be comfortable like taking care of that. We see a lot of drug rashes. I also like the other day I saw like this keto covered with like this blistering rash everywhere. So it's every day. It's like every time I walk into the patient's room, it's very different. Uh, I practice most, mostly like 95% medical and surgical dermatology. So by surgical dermatology, I mean like excisions for skin cancer or cysts and lipoma. And then I do about 5% of cosmetics. Um, but if you're interested in doing more cosmetics, you know, you could be at a place where you have access to lasers or, you know, microneedling and other stuff. And, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of that. Um, so it, it very much depends on what you're interested in doing. Um, and like I said, if you want to be in an academic uh, place, um, then you can even do inpatient dermatology. So when I was both at Harvard as well as University of Miami, there was a very, very strong inpatient uh, dermatology that we kind of focused on because University of Miami and University of Minnesota, I think are the only two places in the US where they have, where dermatologists act like primary admitting physicians. So not we don't act like a consultant, but more like actual primary admitting uh, physicians. Physicians. So we would take care of pretty sick patients with cutaneous T cell lymphoma or psoriasis all over that would be admitted under our team and we would manage their patient, uh, manage the patient, not only their skin condition, but also like their hypertension, their diabetes and whatnot. So if you have that sort of a more interest in more heavy medical dermatology, then, you know, academic institutions are a very good place to be because you can see pretty sick patients round on them in the hospital setting. One of my mentors, Dr. Daniela Kroshensky from Mass General Hospital, that's like her thing. She's very well known in the field. She used to see, she still had her clinic, but at the end of the day, she would go and round on these inpatients. So completely what you want to do, you know, in Durham, that's like the best thing about it. It's a little bit of mix of everything. So it makes your days really, really fun. And like I said, you know, working four days a week also makes you just really fun from a mental and psychological standpoint. Typically, we don't take calls on the weekends. Um, even during the week, some places you might require to, but like for me, I don't take any calls or anything. So weekends are my family time. So do you guys have any other questions about dermatology in general and what our day looks like or anything like that? Let me know. I think I have one question. Do you have to be interested in research to go into dermatology? You don't have to be interested because, but the thing is dermatology is extremely competitive, extremely competitive to go and in, get into. When I, the year I was applying in dermatology, even though I was coming from Harvard, I think we had more than 20 people applying and everyone was super stressed out and one person actually did not match. So it is like you, the, the main reason to do research is you really have to show you're genuinely, genuinely interested in, in it. You don't have to like necessarily start your research from the very beginning of medical school. Like I said, a lot of people don't even know they want to do dermatology till like the third year or so. But because you'll see the other people applying into Durham are so competitive that you almost have to have good research to be able to get um, selected. I was on the admissions or selection committee when I was at University of Miami because I was one of the chief residents there. And so I got to review all the applicants and it's just phenomenal, you know, and I feel like every year it's getting harder and harder, but like everyone had really high uh, board scores. And I mean, honestly, like those scores are like the step scores are used more for screening purposes, not for selection purposes. So you don't really have to have super high scores, but you need to have a certain number to just like for the for the uh, programs to even consider you in some way. Uh, but then after that, they do look like what's unique about you. Um, so like, you know, in my case, I was still international. So it was like very much more difficult because a lot of programs like don't sponsor and whatnot. But like, um, I think my interesting story was that I had gone to pretty good schools, but not only that, I had published in like really good like nature and science. And then I had volunteered in a bunch of different countries across the world, with, not just 
to you know kind of check off the check boxes but more so you have to show that you're genuinely interested in doing things like that and you know at the end of the day the programs want you to be proud want to be proud of who you are and want you to like eventually do something good for the field so as long as you're able to show like some sort of leadership skills my one biggest piece of advice would be to find a good mentor because honestly for me I think I am where I am today because I my mentors helped me so much so just email a bunch of people I just like literally cold called email a bunch of faculty members at Harvard once I decided I wanted to become a dermatologist or even other institutions you can literally email people even at other schools you can um, go to the AAD the American Academy of Dermatology website or there is the Skin of Color Society. You can go to their website, try to find mentors and just reach out to them. You'll be surprised so many times people have like um, good case reports that they are willing to work with you and you can type it up and that's you know a publication for you. Or you can always find some interesting ways to work together. And having mentors work for a couple of different things. One is you can find the right number of research projects. But the second thing is also if they write a strong letter for you, like those letter of recommendations really, really matter. So if they write a really strong letter for you, and especially if the letter is coming from someone who's well known in general, that's going to help you in, you know, a lot, a lot. All right. So that was the first question. Let me quickly see the other questions. Is there a difference between cases you see in private practice versus working in a hospital setting? I would say yes, because private practice is much more like bread and butter cases like acne, rosacea, eczema, uh, hospital setting, you're going to see much more, a little bit of more like the complicated cases, so more autoimmune, like blistering conditions and whatnot, just because sometimes the private practice docs, if they're not comfortable taking care of these complicated patients, they'll just send them to an academic institution. But that being said, it very much depends on the comfort, like, you know, especially when you're pretty fresh out of residency, because you have seen all this stuff, like you feel much more comfortable taking care of it. But probably I've, once I've been doing this for 10, 15 years and I lose, you know, kind of um, touch of uh, taking care of the more complicated patients, maybe that at that point I would refer to academic centers. But yeah, overall, there is slightly a, a difference in, in the kind of cases you see. Why did you go into derm instead of plastics? Um, well, that's a very good question. Uh, it depends. You know, I didn't. I didn't want to do only surgeries. I loved like doing actual medicine too. Um, to me, it's really fun. Like another best thing, good thing about dermatology is like you build really long term relationship with your patients. I mean, I've been practicing at this place for only a year and a half or so, but I have been seeing some of my patients on every six month basis for skin cancers. Uh, follow-ups or skin uh, full body skin checks and they get to know you beyond just being your physician you know they they ask me about my daughter every time recently I had a family member who was really sick but they asked me about that so like building that kind of a relationship really matters because trust me you want to be happy at the end of the day because whatever you're doing will get monotonous one day but if as long as what you're doing makes you happy. And, you know, for some people that might be doing radiology and not interacting with people, but depending on your personality, like if you're someone who likes to chat with people who like small talks, then dermatology is like really fun that way. Uh, so plastics, yeah, it would probably be much, much more procedural and derm is like the right amount of procedures for me. Uh, there are some dermatologists who like to do like like mostly surgeries and they're the ones that typically do a Mohs fellowship and then they do the skin cancer surgeries and whatnot. Um, you don't have to do a Mohs fellowship to be able to do Mohs, but if you are truly, if you truly want to be good at it and want to do big cases on the face and stuff, it's always a good idea to do, do Mohs. What was residency like and having kiddos during training? You know, it has its challenges, but at the same time, it's so, it's so worth it. Like, I'm so glad. So I had my kid literally when I started my chief year, which was my last year of residency. So there were some challenges in the sense that even during like my few weeks of maternity, I, I was constantly like working on my emails and stuff. But then at the same time, it was a pretty good timing because we had some flexibility in terms of like we, used, we get elective times and whatnot during that time of our training. And I used that time to like spend time with my kid too. So it's very, it's, it's flexible in some way, but regardless having a kid in residency, no matter whichever specialty you're doing, it's challenging, you know, like I would wake up at five o'clock to like 
pump and like you know then go to work really early try to like pump in between clinics so it's not smooth but again if i had to do it all over again i 100 would do it because it's, it's just 100 worth it why is dermatology so competitive that's a very good question you know of course it is i'll be honest it is considered one of the lifestyle specialty again you shouldn't be going into derm just because of that you should really like what you're doing because trust me like this this is what I do all day long. So if I chose to do this only because of the lifestyle, that wouldn't be worth it. I truly have to enjoy, you know, seeing the cases I see in clinic, doing the full body skin checks. Otherwise, money is not like is, is all uh, everything at the end of the day. You really have to enjoy your work. Um, probably the reason dermatology is competitive is, is because they, there are a very limited number of spots for training. So if they had more uh programs or more training spots then there would be more dermat dermatologists but because that's sort of restricted that's why it's pretty competitive there is still a pretty high demand for dermatologists i can assure you 100 percent. once you're done with your training it'll be no problem to find a good job no matter where you want to go of course all the big cities like you know new york miami those places are saturated but you don't really have to go in the middle of nowhere. You can you can pretty much go anywhere and, you know, you'll have tons of job opportunities just because there is still a very high demand for dermatologists. But because the number of residency spots are so limited, the supply is not as high. Do you expect the changes to step exams to make a difference in the selection criteria for extremely competitive specialties? Um, it's a good question. Honestly, I don't think anyone really knows what's going to be the impact but like i said the step exams are used more for a screening process rather than you know like people relying on rather than the programs relying on um selecting patients um selecting students based on that so um uh, you still should have a pretty well-rounded uh, CV or resume, whatever you call it, and you know try to do as much as, especially the leadership thing. So if you're starting a foundation or if you're starting like a journal club and then publishing or doing like volunteering opportunities, then that just like, you know, gives interesting topics for people to talk to you about during interviews because people want the program directors when we are on the other side of the selection process, we want unique people or someone with a cool story and talk about that during your interview. So try to do something that's different from everyone else. Um, does your research have to be focused on dermatology? Not necessarily, you know, most of my research work was um, prior to medical school and it wasn't even like directly related to dermatology. It was more like to show that you are a person who's like curious, who likes to think, who likes to like, you know, work hard, who likes to publish those kind of things. So more to tell about who you are. Uh, of course, if your research is about dermatology, that helps, but not, not too many people have contacts. Like when I was in training, I saw some of my colleagues whose parents are dermatologists or who know people and they had started doing this stuff really early on. And that's amazing, but not everyone has contacts, right? Like I had no one in my family who's even a physician. So, and, and that's fine. You can start whenever, but you just have to be genuine about what you're doing. You know, ju just don't, don't lie along the process. Cause trust, trust me, it comes out. Program directors can tell if someone is lying, don't be like too eager during your like interview process. And, um, or even in your essays and stuff, don't say like you're going to change the world like that's too much right because realistically no one does that but of course you, you still should come off like very ambitious someone with a cool story but just you know at the same time be like realistic and especially don't lie because um uh, a people can tell and then you know you'll be surprised it's dermatology is a pretty small uh, network or a small um like people talk a lot even among different program directors because you know people are friends with each other and doing all our AAD meetings and stuff, like even if you're a medical student, people will be like, oh, like, so it comes off. So you just be a little careful about that stuff. Does medical school prestige matter for dermatology residency? Uh, this is hard to say. I mean, again, I had, you know, a ton of um, my co-residents who came from schools that might not be like Ivy League schools. So it's totally possible to like go into dermatology no matter which school you're coming from. But that being said, it probably helps if you're coming from a school that has, a, you know, is an Ivy League or has some sort of reputation just because, I don't know, unfortunately that's how it does work. But it, that does not mean that, like one of my closest friends who uh, was a dermatology resident at um, Harvard, 
he went to medical school in Hawaii. And I don't even think they had like a proper dermatology uh, residency program there or like he didn't really have the right mentors there. But at the same time, he was really good, of course, and like what he was doing and he was very interested. And so then he ended up being at the Harvard Dermatology Residency Program. So you can come from wherever you are. And remember, everything is possible. You just have to make yourself unique. Again, I was on a visa and being on a visa, on a student visa or work visa and getting into dermatology is very hard, but it's not impossible. You just have to like make it work. I probably had tons of people like who like, you know, told me it was going to be challenging. I cried a lot. And, you know, it was a very, very stressful procedure, uh, not procedure process. But like I said, it's possible. Just just don't give up. Have faith in yourself and keep pushing because I can promise you it is 100 percent worth it at the end of training. No matter how long medical school is, no how long training is, it is going to end one day. You are going to have a regular life one day. And even if it's a 10-year, 12-year process, just remember there is light at the end of the tunnel. And once you're done with your training, it is 100% worth it. And you're going to be so happy as a dermatologist. I've yet to meet any of my colleagues right now who are attending dermatologists who are like unhappy with their life. Everyone's really, really genuinely happy. Um, can you please comment as you were on admissions committee at U of at University of Miami, what matching is going to look for now that step one is pass fail and step two is correct. I think I, I touched on this briefly. So now that, you know, if scores are not going to be a more, much more of a reliable thing, then probably just make sure, you know, you have research experience. You don't always have to take a year off to do research to get into Durham, but that being said, a lot of places will recommend that you do so at Harvard some of my mentors did tell me that I should have you know taken a year off for me it was not going to work out again just being on a visa and stuff but what I did was I worked incredibly hard and like published a lot in a few months by like sleeping four hours a night or something like that because I wanted to kind of like make make up for like not doing that one year of extra research so again you don't have to do it but you probably have to work really hard and sacrifice on the other end. You mentioned you were an international student. How hard was it for you to get into medical school and the financial aspect of it? Um, it is very hard to get into medical school just because uh, a lot of the state schools, so none of the California schools even take application from you if you're on a visa. Um, but that being said, I personally think in some way it's relatively easier to get into some of the top schools just because they have a lot of funding. So be, I didn't get that many interviews for medical school, to be honest. Um, and I applied to a ton of schools, but the ones that I got interviews from were most of the really good schools. So Stanford, Brown, um, Harvard, and places like that. And they also tend to have pretty good financial, um, uh, like either scholarships or uh, financial aid. Um, again, because I was at the Harvard MIT HST program, we had to do research as part of our requirement the first two years. But one of the good things about doing the research was that we, we got paid, I think, 15000 um, a year or might be, a, no, probably a year from MIT. So that did take care of some of my tuition. So again, that also meant like, you know, those years were pretty brutal. But regardless of which specialty you do, you know, keep in mind your training years, you have to work really hard. There is no easy route in medicine. You know, everyone's pretty much sleep deprived. It's a long journey, but again, it's definitely worth it at the end. There is light at the end of the tunnel. It's not, your life is not going to be like that forever. Once you're done with your training, depending on which specialty you're going into, um, you will have a lot of flexibility. Definitely, you know, another important thing, because I used to be a person, um, like I always had these goals in mind. I had to get them like blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, unfortunately, I lost my father in the middle of the night one night when I was in my first year of medical school. And it changed me in so many ways because I realized that of course you have to have a career and be very good at it. But at the same time, you have to enjoy your time with your family because one thing and, you know, things can be over, you know, one day you have it all and the next day it's gone. So enjoy life, you know, enjoy what you're doing because you're not going to get these days back. You know, not when I look back, I'm like, man, I'm, I miss my twenties, you know, you're not going to get back. So make sure you're also like trying to get do things outside medicine. Uh, medicine is going to be really hard working, but then at the same time, 
once it ends, make sure you're doing other things in life too. Um, and that's just so important. So the work-life balance, I think it's very important. Like when I was in medical school, my husband, well, at the time we were dating, he was in New York and I was in Boston. And I remember I used to study really hard, like Monday through Fridays. And then I would take the weekends off to be able to spend time with him. And that worked for me. You know, I had a friend, um, she, or her thing was like blogging and like Instagram and social media and whatnot. So that was her creative outlet. So find something that works for you because otherwise you could go insane. Cause you know, we, we hear about burnout all the time, all the time, you know, even at Harvard, like people get depressed. So like, you need to have some other way of like making sure you're sane, you know, exercise, eat right. All those simple things we take for granted, make sure you're taking care of yourself. Anyway, a lot of advice, but if you guys have any other question, you know, feel free to reach out to me even um, through my Instagram. Uh, it's DRS Paul Durham at um, DRS Paul Durham. And then my email is also DRS Paul Durham at gmail.com. Again, I try to be genuine. Like I'm not trying to, you know, you need to do whatever makes you happy at the end of the day, because life is so short and so unpredictable. Just enjoy it. You know, I have some very close friends who are doing um, surgery, like orthopedic surgery, who are doing uh, very, you know, like really hard, hard neurosurgery. And I see them and they're working a lot, but at the same time, they really enjoy what they're doing. And if that's the case, it's 100% worth it. You should not just pick a field because the hours are easy or something like that. You truly have to enjoy driving to work every day saying that, okay, today's going to be a fun day, you know, not like today's going to be a short day or a long day. All right. So that was a lot of uh, advice. If you guys have any other questions, let me know. I want to very quickly talk about a few cases that we typically see in um, outpatient clinics in dermatology. And hopefully if you guys, I mean, these are common things. So if you guys have these concerns, maybe this will help answer your questions too. So... This is my first case. Again, they're very straightforward. I'm not trying to quiz you guys or anything. So this is more for you to learn and have fun and um, get an idea of what we see in our clinics on a regular basis. So this is a 16 year old male who walks into my clinic. I open the door and I see that, you know, he has this, uh, these red bumps all over his face. So I don't know how interactive this is, but can some of you can you tell me a few questions you would ask the patient? Like, how would you go about getting a history from the patient? I'll give you guys a pause to uh, get back to me. A few people are saying this looks like cystic acne. That's excellent. So sometimes, you know, and, and that's excellent. But what are the kind of questions are you going to ask them? Like, you know, very basics. Like, what are the questions you ask when you try to get an HPI when you go in to see a patient? Perfect. How long has he had this diet? That's a very good point. And I'll talk a little bit about the true evidence behind diet. Is it itchy? I love it. Yeah, almost any time... Um, you know, anyone walks into a rash, it's always a very good idea to ask, is your uh, rash itchy? Skincare routine, that's very, very good, especially in this world of social media influencers and stuff. You know, people use all their, all these crazy 10-step skincare routine and sometimes make their skin condition much worse than, uh, than better. Any new medication, excellent, because this can be caused because of medication too. Any pain or discomfort, yeah, because that will help you kind of classify the grade, you know, if, if it's mild, moderate to severe. Family history, very, very good. Any allergies, of course. Does the appearance change with certain habits? Excellent question, you know, whether it's, um, you know, if they're washing their face enough or not, or is it flaring after they're working out? Or is it, if it's a female, is it getting worse with their menstrual cycle? What have you tried so far to help with it? Such an important question because sometimes maybe they have tried a bunch of things that I was planning to try. And that means that that's not gonna be enough. I need to scale it up. Alcohol consumption, always a good question. 
All right, excellent questions. So yeah, you're right. So this is acne, not necessarily cystic acne, but this is acne in dermatology. We see this a lot, right? And one thing I wanna tell you guys is in today's day and age, honestly, no one should have acne because we have such good medications for acne. Sometimes people end up spending too much money on like Sephora products and whatnot. But instead of doing that, it's it's probably worth, like if you have medical insurance, it's probably worth just going to a dermatologist because more, your um, actual visit might be covered by your insurance. And these medications are also covered by your insurance. And we, we can typically give you the right thing because acne is not that like, no, not every acne is the same, right? So acne, we first thing we do is we assess the severity of the acne. So we classify it mild, moderate to severe. And then there's also for females, there is hormonal acne. Hormonal acne is typically, you know, the distribution is very different. It's along the lower jawline, and it's the one that is mostly worse with their menstrual cycle, and rest of the time, it's more or less fine. Everyone's acne is worse with their menstrual cycle, so that's, like, not the only criteria for hormonal acne. That's why the distribution matters, and also the fact that for hormonal acne, it's typically right around the uh, menstrual cycle when their acne is horrible, and the rest of the time, it's more or less fine. But then other than hormonal acne, we have mild, moderate to severe acne. And so the first thing we do is come up with like, um, assess the severity of it. And then the second thing is we develop a treatment plan. So mild acne, the way we decide that is if it's mostly whiteheads and blackheads, which are in the medical term terminology for that is comedones. So open comedones are whiteheads, sorry, open comedones are blackheads and closed comedones are whiteheads. And then you might have very few minimal pimples here and there. So that is mild acne. And for mild acne, sometimes even the primary care can treat it or they might even send the patient to dermatologist. And then that's when, yes, you can try, you know, the over-the-counter products. Usually salicylic acid is like the mildest thing that can help you with super mild acne. Then benzoyl peroxide, which is also over-the-counter. So OTC means over-the-counter. Benzoyl peroxide, there is data showing that benzoyl peroxide does help with acne directly. Topical retinoids, those are the ones you use at nighttime. There are a few retinoids that are over the counter. Um, and then retinoids are different from retinol. Retinoids are typically stronger. In the US, you know, it used to be prescription strength up until 2012. And then after that, there are a few that are now over the counter, but like in Canada and other countries, it's still only prescription strength. So they are stronger than retinol. Retinol is more used for anti-aging and wrinkles and stuff like that. But retinoids are used both like for acne, but also, also for anti-aging purposes. And then that, so that's mild acne. And if that's not enough, then uh, you we might do, you come to see a dermatologist and we might do a combination of the benzoyl peroxide retinoid as well as a topical antibiotic, typically in the morning. And then there are other topical options such as dapsone and azelaic acid. Azelaic acid is something that is super safe during pregnancy. Up to 10% is available over the counter and anything stronger than, than that is typically prescription strength. So the photo that I showed was actually more moderate acne. Um, so here you have not only the blackheads and the tiny pimples, but you have also like pustules. So the pimples are now filled with this white pus in it. And then the other pimples too have like more redness around it. And, you know, there might be slight pain with it too. And again, it's maybe it's covering most of the face or even some part of the face. So when we assess mild, moderate and severe acne, we don't necessarily go just by the number of pimples, but also the morphology of the actual lesions. And so for this one, um, in addition to the topicals, we often do oral antibiotics for a short period of time uh, because we don't want people to get resistance towards them, but usually topicals might not be enough. So we add a little bit of oral medications. And then for females, we might consider adding birth control or oral spironolactone. Again, more so if there is hormonal aspect or hormonal acne that we are suspecting. And then if all of this fails, then we might even consider oral vitamin A, which is isotretinoin or Accutane. And then this is more severe acne, where now you start getting these big cysts, which are very, very painful. People start to get scarring with this type of acne. And anytime I see this, if I walk into the patient's room and I see this, I almost always try to like tell my patients that, look, when you have severe acne, 
we can get the acne under control, but if you start getting scarring, it's really, really hard to treat scarring. The only thing that truly helps with acne scarring is laser or microneedling or all these fancy cosmetic purposes. The topicals help very minimally for true scarring. If it's minimal scarring, yeah, retinoids help to some extent, but that's why I always try to emphasize and tell my the parents of, of my patients that get the acne under control the sooner you can, the more you, the longer you wait, the longer you play around with Sephora products. Once you get scarring, that's going to be pretty much irreversible for the rest of your life, unless you're doing all these cosmetic procedures. So when, if it's severe acne, a lot of time we'll just go straight to oral isotretinoin, uh, which is typically a six month course. There is a lot of stigma out there about isotretinoin, but especially in the social media world, because I've been on like Instagram and TikTok talking about this stuff and literally people will attack us if we talk about isotretinoin. But again, it's been FDA approved for decades. As long as you're doing it with the right provider, because we need to keep a close eye on you, you know, it involves monthly appointments. You have to go through the eye pledge system. We need to check your blood work, not every month, but regularly then um, then uh, it's, it's a great treatment because isotretinoin is the closest to cure that we have for acne because most things in dermatology, acne, rosacea, psoriasis, eczema, there is no cure for it necessarily. It's more about keeping things under control with the treatment. Um, but isotretinoin or Accutane is the closest thing we have to cure for acne because once you go through a typically a six month course of this medicine, most people, not all, they don't get the acne back for the rest of their life. That being said, there are a few people we might need to do multiple courses of Accutane. Um, and then, you know, again, if someone is hesitant to do Accutane, we might still do the oral antibiotics and uh, even the oral birth control or oral spermalactone. I'll quickly stop by to um, answer some of your questions. Does race, gender, ethnicity have an uh, effect on acne? Well, the presentation can be very different in dark skin. And sometimes, you know, people are um, not, I wouldn't say misdiagnosed, but like the, di the diagnosis of even something simple as acne is delayed because they just look so different. And unfortunately, that's not necessarily just true for acne, but a lot of other rashes in dermatology because most of the textbooks that we read in dermatology are based on like, you know, uh, uh, skin type one and two. And and when we see darker patients, even the redness doesn't look red on their skin. It looks more like a dark red brown color. Um, so again, luckily I, I was fortunate to train at the University of Miami we, where we saw a lot of uh, patients with skin of color. But depending on when you're training, if you train at a place where you don't see skin of color, you might, you know, not be very comfortable uh, because rashes do look very different. You know, again, I'm coming from India. I have a focus. Um, I'm interested in, you know, more brown skin, you know, South Asians, and uh, I am part of the Skin of Color Society. And, you know, oftentimes the lectures I see there are so different from the other regular lectures that we see focused on lighter skin types. Okay. What's misconception or myth regarding skin you wish people would stop believing? My biggest thing I say is uh, everyone needs to wear sunscreen. So if you have darker skin type, it doesn't mean that you don't need sunscreen because while you might have lower chances of skin cancer, if you are concerned about dark spots, like aging, like fine wrinkles and just like coarseness on the skin, if you want to prevent that, even if you're darker skin type, you should be wearing sunscreen. My daughter is two and a half years old. She wears sunscreen every day. She wants a day, but every day. What is the average treatment time for acne? It depends. Most of the time we're able to get people clear within three months or so because Accutane 2 works pretty quickly and in three to four months we'll clear it. But if you're doing Accutane, it's a six month course typically. And which factors affect it the most? Which factors affect it the most? For treatment, you mean? Well, number one, if they're being compliant with their medication or not. Okay. What is the best SPF for skin of color? Ah, I don't know if you guys have TikTok, but on TikTok, I post a lot of videos on uh, skin of color. So my handle on TikTok is derm for brown skin. So D-E-R-M number four, brown skin. And I have reviewed a few videos like putting the SPF on me to see how, what it looks like in skin of color. I did a few for like a lot of, the, so in general, we as dermatologists, we always recommend mineral sunscreen over chemical sunscreen. And mineral sunscreen means the ones that have zinc or titanium oxide in it because they act like a shield protecting you from the sun directly. Whereas the chemical ones, these chemicals do get absorbed into a blood. And, um, you know, there's, 
potential and we know they get absorbed into a blood whether it's bad or not we don't know that but for my pregnant patients for my kids less than two years old i always say mineral sunscreen the other thing is chemical sunscreen causes a lot of rashes so if you have rosacea or if you have sensitive skin people break out into rashes from using the chemical sunscreen and physical sunscreens usually you don't get those rashes. Also, technically for chemical sunscreen, you're supposed to wear them 15 minutes before you go out in the sun. Physical sunscreen, you don't necessarily need to do that. But so in general, I always recommend uh, uh, physical sunscreen or mineral ones with zinc and titanium. But the main problem is that sometimes some of them tend to leave a white cast, but there are quite a few out there. If you rub it in, especially it, it blends really well, especially for skin of color. They also come in the tinted form, which has a little brownish hue to it, which like for me, I love it because it almost looks like foundation. So I never use foundation after using my sunscreen. Um, some of them tend to be expensive. So I did a review on the prices too. But then very recently, I think I posted one. There is one from Solbar, S-O-L-B-A-R. Um, Solbar Zinc Sunscreen. It's only like 12 bucks or something on Amazon. It, it has zinc in it and it blends really well for skin of color too. What is your opinion on curology? Oh, we're going far, far away from dermatology now. That's a whole different topic, but I'll be posting videos on TikTok if you're interested about that. Can hormonal acne be treated in any other way for those who fear the side effects of birth control or spironolactone uh, or Accutane? Yes, it can. So spironolactone is another medication we use in, in hormonal acne. And that one, uh, it's spironolactone, I don't know if you guys are aware of or not, it's a birth a birth. It's a blood pressure medication. Uh, it's a diuretic. So what it does, it, it makes you pee. And that's how like it also lowers your blood pressure. But um, um, in, in uh, dermatology, we use it at a much lower concentration, so a different concentration. And it uh, is pretty safe. And we don't even have to check blood work or anything on this medicine. And um, it, it works really well for hormonal acne. So there are other options. Okay. So going back to our case, we only have 10 more minutes. So going back to our case, let's see. So I just wanted to like focus some key takeaways on, on uh, acne. So for treatment of very mild acne, benzoyl peroxide face wash in the morning. And benzoyl peroxide comes in different strengths. So it ranges from 2.5 to 10%. And the lower the strength, the less irritating or less drawing it is on the face. And there's actually data showing that it works just as effectively as a higher percentage one. So I always recommend my patients to go for a lower percentage benzoyl peroxide. And you don't even have to use it every day in the morning if it's drawing out your skin too much. Just use it a few times in a week, even that works. And it's also very important because if you're using like a topical antibiotic such as clindamycin, the benzoyl peroxide prevents resistance towards the clindamycin. So that's the another purpose of it aside from the fact that it does directly help with acne too. But for mild acne, benzoyl peroxide in the morning and a retinoid at night. Prescription ones are, you know, example is tretinoin. But if you're looking at over-the-counter, I think I have a slide on a couple of over-the-counter options. You can uh, try that too before you see a dermatologist. But once you see a dermatologist, um, you know, we'll give you more prescription stuff. So if, if that's, if the benzoyl peroxide and retinoid is not keeping it under control, then we add things like clindamycin. And then another thing, it's important to tell our patients that it takes eight to 12 weeks to see results. So you have to be patient with it. I kind of give the analogy of like weight loss it doesn't happen overnight. You have to be consistent about eating right and working out and you'll see results in a few weeks. Same thing with skincare. It doesn't happen overnight. You have to be consistent with it, but if you're good with it, you will notice, um, the right products will make a difference on your skin. Also, 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 very simple getaway, uh, takeaway. Moisturize your skin, no matter if you have oily skin or not, moisturize your skin multiple times um, in a day because if your skin is too dry, it makes your acne worse. And then very important to wear sunscreen, no matter what your skin type is, because that helps you also prevent the hyperpigmentation that you might get after acne. All right, let's see. Uh, these are some, if you guys want to take a photo or something, these are some examples of over-the-counter benzoyl peroxide that I do recommend because these are much lower percentage. And I went over this concept how like a lower percentage ones is less irritating on the skin. 
And these are examples of over-the-counter retinoids that people use. It's very important to tell them or to tell patients to use it the right way, which is to use a very tiny amount in the beginning, use it every other night or so. And then only if you can tolerate it, then use it every night. I've been using retinoids for the last six to seven years. And even then I cannot use it every night because it dries out my skin, especially in Southern California. So I just use it like five times a week or something. Uh, so the prescription retinoids are usually tretinoin, tazarotene, or adapalene, and then there's a new one that came out too, but there are a few that are over the counter, and those are usually adapalenes. Uh, this is just a slide on how to use retinoids, but I think I quickly went over it. Um, this was something about Accutane. This is a little too much details for you. I mean, some of these slides I had made for my other primary care colleagues. Uh, but one main thing is if you guys have any friends and families, just let them know that Accutane is actually a safe treatment when it's done with, in, the, in the right way under the supervision of a dermatologist, because there is so much stigma out there in the, in the community, and especially on social media. All right. Oh, I want to very quickly talk about this because I bet a lot of people talk about this, like food, food and acne. So important takeaway, we don't have too much data. We have some data suggesting that certain foods, such as food with high glycemic index, which means very sugary food, those might make acne worse. There is some evidence suggesting that cow's milk, especially skim milk more than um, whole milk, but milk in general might make acne worse. And then same thing goes with animal-based uh, protein supplements. So the whey protein supplements that might make uh, acne worse. That being said, the American Academy of Dermatology does not make any recommendation in terms of what sort of diet changes you need to make. It just says that, you know, if you're drinking too much cow's milk every single day, maybe be careful, cut it down just a little bit, but you don't have to make drastic changes to your diet because the data we have is still, you know, kind of early, kind of suggestive. Um, but, you know, I'll tell my patients, you know, don't give up on cow's milk if you like it, just, just drink in moderation, switch it up with almond milk or something. And then there's data showing omega-3 fatty acid found in a lot of fish that help with acne, fruits and vegetables help with acne, things like that. And then a lot of this evidence that I talked about comes from guidelines that came out uh, in the uh, in our American Academy of Dermatology Journal, which is the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology known as JAD. And then uh, we do have a, a American Acne and Rosacea Society that also has a lot of guidelines. All right, I'm not sure if we truly have time uh, for these rashes. But if you guys want, let me know if you have any other questions. I know we have eight minutes or so. Um, I do have patients starting at noon here in, uh, on the West Coast. So I'll, I'll leave the last few minutes to talk a little bit about any last questions that you guys might have. Again, you can always reach out to me through my email or through social media, whatever. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions regarding dermatology in general or whatever you want. So I'll give you guys a few minutes to, or a few seconds to like ask me any questions that you might have. While I'm talking to my staff. But every specialty is really good. You know, like I said, I have a lot of close friends who are pediatricians, surgeons, and medicine at the end of the day, does make you happy, you know, because it's much more than, you know, like the financial aspect of it. It's more because it truly, you know, especially with COVID and everything, when you're making a difference in other people's life, it, it, it makes, it makes you pretty content at the end of the day. You know, I was not a frontline worker as a dermatologist, but at the same time, you know, I was working the whole time. And, you know, whether it's my patient, this last year was scary for everyone. And even in, even though it's a dermatology, people sometimes make fun and think it's all about cosmetics. You know, you don't, 
I don't see mostly cosmetics. I mostly see medical derm. And I had patients who would like freak out and come in because some rash popped up on their skin and they thought they were, is it COVID related? Or they were just like so stressed or people who are just like super itchy and whatnot. And usually we're able to help because we have pretty good medicines to take care of that. And that's sort of a relief when they get that and just seeing how happy they are. I mean, that makes it 100% worth it, you know? And um, like I said, you know, it's, it's just a long-term relationship you build with your patients. When patients ask me about my daughter, I almost always show share photos of my daughter with my patients or they'll share, you know, something. They'll bring in like tiny gifts and stuff. Like it's just like more more like, you know, when people get to know you as a person, that's what makes it really fun. And like I said, when I drive to work during my uh, morning commute, um, I'm just looking forward to coming to work because I, I love it. And to answer that question I, that I used to ask my female at, uh, attending physician, if I had to do this all over again, I would 100% do it because I feel like I am genuinely happy and I wouldn't have it any other way. All right, guys, so if you have any other questions, just reach out to me. And otherwise, I think I'm going to end it right now. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Paul. This was a wonderful presentation. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to answer all of our questions. We really appreciate it. Um, for everyone watching, the Google form has now been posted in the chat box. And um, it will be posted in the description soon, so keep an eye out for that. And quickly, just some housekeeping things. Um, this Friday will be the start of our January roundup. So for those of you who are new or aren't familiar with our roundups, we hold monthly roundups that allow you to go back and watch previous live streams that you weren't able to attend. So this allows you to earn credit for these past sessions. So every form for the month of Janu January will open this Friday at 11.59 p.m. Eastern and will close Sunday at 11.59 Eastern. You will be able to access these forms through a document that will be on our website when the roundup period opens. And additionally, every link is also in the description of each video. We also have a YouTube playlist for each month um, to make it easier for you all to access those. And additionally, thank you all again for attending and thank you, Dr. Paul, so much for taking the time to do this today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And if you guys want more resources on dermatology, I would recommend checking out the American Academy of Dermatology website. They have a lot of information, also like research opportunities or like shadowing opportunities or reaching out to mentors. And then also Skin of Color Society, which focuses on uh, patients with skin of color uh, and dermatology. All right.